I have a supplemental lecture on the Baroque period that will help us kind of transition how we get from the Renaissance to the modern era. The lecture is not too lengthy, but it, I think it gives give you kind of an idea of what Baroque art is. So the Baroque, there are three different Baroques. There is a Baroque in Italy that is based on the Catholic Counter-Reformation, trying to reset itself based on the scandals and the corruption that left the that made the Reformation happen in the North. We will also look at a secular Baroque going on in the North with the Dutch and the Germans and the British. And then there is also an aristocratic Baroque that is a part of King Louis XIV and also going on with Spanish kings as well. So what defines the Baroque is it's a period that begins around 1600 in Rome and it spreads in the 17th and 18th centuries. It, a Baroque is kind of a broken shell. A, uh, it's a very decorative, kind of stylish way of approaching architecture and painting, very much about the individuality of the artists rather than a specific style too. In the Baroque, we see grand architecture and one way of thinking about the Baroque is theater and drama, th theatrical lighting, dramatic compositions, dramatic architecture. And we also see the develop of things like uh, opera as well. Here you're looking at St. Peter's Basilica. This is the largest basilica in the world in Rome. It has a massive dome designed by Michelangelo, a facade designed by Michelangelo, and the front of it, the colonnade, is designed by another great sculpture, Gian Lorenzo Bernini. So Bernini in the colonnade has put dozens of sculptures, created this kind of key, almost keyhole-like shape, and this is one of the things that we'll also see in the Baroque, is that in the Baroque, it is much less about the simple geometric shapes and much more about more complex geometric shapes, ovals and things like that, rather than perfect circles. This is the Baldachin at St. Peter's. This is a sculpted bronze uh, canopy over the altar. This is also designed by Bernini. It is marking a, the kind of the monument for St. Peter's tomb underneath. It's a mixture of sculpture and architecture and shows us also that sense of complete decoration that you will see in the Baroque. Bernini also designs the Ecstasy of St. Teresa. So in the Coronado Chapel, we have these sculpted marbles of St. Teresa and the vision that she had of a saint who pierced her stomach with a golden arrow. She is laying in ecstasy, nearly a sexual ecstasy. Behind her is a unseen window that has gilded rods coming off of it that appear as if the golden light of heaven is shining on this. We also have colored marble that surrounds all of this. We have some stucco sculptures also here that are liquefied, basically kind of cement-like. And we also see some marble sculptures carved here and here as if there is a grand theater that we are watching this happen with other patrons of the church. This is a great example of the kind of drama and theater that you would typically find in a, uh, a Baroque work of art. From the painter Caravaggio, 
we get a painter probably working from optics who is creating grand sense of light and dark. So in the calling of St. Matthew here, we have a kind of gloomy window. Christ is bringing light into the dark space. And we get a sense of really bright, bright highlights and then these deep darks that when you have light shine like this, you wouldn't have these deep, rich shadows. This is a style that Caravaggio is creating. And we can see this kind of darkish style a bit in the Venetian painter Titian, but Caravaggio takes it to another place. You see it also in his painting Judith Beheading Holofernes as well. Maybe a self-portrait here of Caravaggio. Again, the really bright highlights and then the shadows that surround it that don't seem to correspond to how bright these highlights are. In, Art in Artisa Migia Gentilici, we see a follower of Caravaggio, the Caravisti, who have taken his light and dark relationships and the drama of them, and we see her also doing a image of Judas slaying Holofernes. So in the image here, Judith, who has snuck into the general Holofernes, seduced him and then beheaded him, saving her people. We see a very dramatic, almost unreal kind of blood spurting here as she's beheading him. Here, it's gritty. It's much more naturalistic. The mattress is getting filthy from the blood. Uh, the light and the dark are even more dramatic than we see in Caravaggio. She is a great, great painter and, and maybe even more uh, more sense of drama in her paintings than you might find in Caravaggio. The secular Baroque in the North. So in the North, we don't find with the Reformation, the Lutherans, the Calvinists, we don't find the elaborate churches that the Italians have. Instead, you find very kind of sparse spaces. They are simply for worship, they are not for, I guess, in a way, idol worship, where you have lots of statues and lots of paintings. So it's much more, the Calvinists are much more um, refined in this. So where does art then end up? It ends up in the home. So with the Dutch, you have a thriving middle class. You have a thriving merchant community. And from this, we are seeing everyday people buying paintings now. And the artists, again, using optics, are painting paintings that people would want to have in their homes. Still life paintings are especially popular with the Dutch. And Dutch tulips and flowers as well. And you normally will find in these paintings um, meanings in all of the different elements that they're using, like a lily standing in for purity, for example, uh, or other images for vanity or temperance, a lot of moralizing going on in the still lifes. Another form of painting are genre scenes. In the genre scenes, we basically see Dutch people in their Dutch clothes, hanging out, and generally partying and having a good time. So these are not temperate people necessarily. These are people that know how to be moderate, know how to behave in society, and when it comes time to have a good time, they are flirting, eating, drinking, and smoking, or amusing themselves with toys. From Johan Vermeer and the Milkmaid, we get this Dutch painter who did these very small paintings, probably from using optics. And he would put these really kind of thickish, whitish highlights. And these whitish highlights would give the paintings a sense of really kind of reflecting light. He has a great sense of drama and light and dark with the northern light. 
and kind of everyday activities from normal people are being seen now as high art. From Rembrandt, we get the master of light and dark, the master of the palette knife, painting thickly, working in browns and grays, really indebted to the Venetian painter Titian in many ways. We get these really deep, penetrating self-portraits that he does. And he has this great sense of drama in light and dark, in the same way Caravaggio has. The third kind of Baroque art is the art that you would get from the aristocracies of the absolute rulers, the absolute kings like Louis XIV and our Spanish kings as well. Kings that have complete power over their people. No parliament, no um, restraint on the monarchy. You're looking at Louis painted in 1701. He is uh, showing a lot of leg and to go with his draperies, probably wearing a wig. And the reason we're seeing his legs is he was a great dancer. He helps innovate ballet and dance. He also is going to support the arts. And he is going to build one of the most elaborate palaces in all of Europe, the Palace of Versailles. So in the Palace of Versailles, he has decided that he is not going to run the government in the city of Paris. He is going to run it in the countryside. And he is going to build this massive chateau or build on this massive chateau that he has inherited so he can have the entire government living with him and running the government from the countryside. In the Palace of Versailles, you have the elaborate, no expenses spared sense of the Baroque with great ceiling paintings, with lots of uh, illus illusionary optical space. In the Hall of Mirrors, which is the private bedroom to Louis's private chapel, we have outdoor mirrors, ref outdoor windows reflecting on mirrors, giving this sense of grand space. In his garden, they have adopted the classical style of the Romans with lots of geometry, lots of space. Again, one of the great, great palaces ever built. And unfortunately, so much money spent on this palace that it's going to begin to effectively bankrupt France and ultimately lead to the end of the monarchy. The Baroque style is also really evident in the painter Peter Paul Rubens. He is a Netherlandish painter who really confuses 3D space. The long, clear perspective that you see in the Renaissance, and that was also beginning to fade away in mannerism, we see even more faded away in Rubens, where in Rubens, we have here one of his series of 24 paintings that was commissioned by Marie Medici, the wife of Henry IV of France. 21 of the paintings depict Marie's struggles and triumphs in life, and the remaining three are portraits of herself and her parents. Here, in her disembarkation of Marseille, we have a depiction of her arriving in Marseille after she has been married to Henry IV by proxy through Florence. This is a marriage that is assuring the alliances of Florence and now France. And we see her leaving the ship down a gangplank. And we see a number of allegorical figures as well as political figures meeting her. And then allegorical nudes below her kind of, of gods and goddesses. And what you see at the bottom is, I think, what most typifies Peter Paul Rubens' paintings, really fleshy, fleshy women. The last image that I want to show here for this kind of brief kind of primer on the Baroque is this painting of Las Meninas by Diego Velázquez. 
He is a Spanish painter working for King Philip IV in Spain's Golden Age. This painting is produced in 1656. We are seeing the Infanta, Margaret Teresa, the eldest daughter of the near new queen, and her maids of honor who protect her and who ensure that she's getting the best care available along with her dog. In the back is her bodyguard. Here we see Velasquez looking at us, working on the giant painting. You get a sense of the scale. I think, though, what's most interesting of this in this painting is the mirror in the background. In the mirror in the background, we are seeing Philip and the Queen. So if Philip and the Queen are here in the mirror, where are they here? Well, they aren't in the painting, so they must be where we are viewing the painting. What we are effectively seeing here is us as the audience becoming, while we view this painting, the king and the queen. And that, to me, is a really incredible idea that Velasquez has put in this painting to allow all of us to be in their shoes for a moment admiring their daughter. Very cool stuff. Okay, so there is no specific homework from this lecture. This is just kind of trying to kind of tie us from how we get to the Renaissance as we get into modern art. So for our summer class this week, we really are looking at a lot of history here, and I'm trying to make it as brief as possible rather than getting too in-depth. And we will end this week with modern art. Now, if you're in a spring or fall class, this will be entirely different, and there may or may not be more information or some sort of assignment on the broke. Just pay attention to Canvas, to your modules, and look at your weekly breakdown for that. Talk to you soon.